Hello friends and welcome to the Northern Healthy Foods Initiative Northern Gardening Chat. We set this up as an opportunity for our Northern Healthy Foods Initiative gardeners, community food champions, and partner organizations to ask questions and to get feedback on their gardening issues and challenges. We're really happy today we've got a variety of people registered and from a number of communities across the north and through some central um, communities, central Manitoba communities, Norway House, Duck Bay, Water Hen, uh, Leap Rapids, and so on. So that's really great to see the, the participation from folks across Manitoba. So we've lined up some panelists today for you to, uh, we've got some questions lined up and these are the folks that we're gonna tag to, to answer some of your inquiries. We've got about 20 questions that we've had submitted. I think we're a little over 20 now. So hopefully some of the issues and concerns that you have are going to be addressed by these folks. We also have an opportunity at the, towards the end of the broadcast, if you have any questions, so you can type them into the, the chat bar on the right-hand side of your screen and that little webinar uh, question chat screen. So you can type those in as we go along and there'll be an opportunity towards the end of the broadcast. If you haven't had your issue or concern answered, certainly we're hoping that we can help you out with that. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists for today. We have Anthony Mantenko and Anthony's area of expertise is on fruit crops. Anthony actually wasn't able to join us specifically for this time slot but he did get some questions posed to him. And so he has sent those questions answers back to me. And uh, so I'm going to be able to read off the, the answers to, to questions related to fruit crops. Uh, John Wawlowski is joining us today. And John is uh, an expert in entomology. And that's the uh, insects, bugs, creepy crawlies. John's the expert on all of those, all of those sorts of critters. Tom Gonzalez, he's our expert in vegetable production. And so we've got a number of questions lined up for Tom today. Uh, both John, Tom and Anthony are uh, located in our Carmen office working for Manitoba Agriculture, Food and Resource Development. So those folks are located in Carmen, Manitoba. My name is Marnie McCracken and I work for Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development out of our The Paw office. And also helping us out today is our webinar manager. Lori keeps everything working behind the scenes, Lori Forbes, and she is a client service coordinator. And Lori's also located in the PAW office. So we're gonna start right into it. And this is one of the questions that I got asked and uh, submitted. And uh, the question is, what are these? And there's a picture of a uh, creepy crawly on the screen. And um, I'm going to peg uh, John to answer this question. Okay, so first of all, this is not an insect. This is a slug. And slugs are members of a group called mollusks, which are quite different than insects are. Mollusks like damp environments. So most mollusks actually live in water, but snails, some snails and slugs uh, do live on land, but they still need a damp environment in order to survive. So where you get slugs is uh, often in situations where you've got a really, really dense canopy, or if you're using a lot of mulch. Now, mulch has many good attributes to it. There's many reasons you want mulch in your garden. It helps keep the moisture in, uh, keeps your garden from drying out. Uh, there, it's good in many ways, but one of the trade-offs is sometimes if you are using a lot of mulch, that could create a damp environment that will make slugs a bit more prevalent. So uh, there's a few options you've got. If, if you do find that you've got too many slugs and they're making a mess of your plants, uh, first of all, the way they feed, uh, they don't have mandibles like insects. They have, it's almost like a scraper for a mouth part. So they rasp away at the leaves, they kind of make them bleed their juice and then they suck that up. So uh, you'll notice if they're feeding on your lettuce or your spinach, it's not so much chunks that are gone, it's these big uh, white streaks where they've basically taken off uh, a surface of 
the plant material and you can kind of see some of the veins and things that are left. So that's the way they're feeding. Now, controlling them can be tricky. Again, they're not insects, so you can't just go to the hardware store and buy some of the common insecticides and hope they work on slugs. A lot of insecticides just don't work well on slugs. There are baits that you can buy. Now, not all hardware stores would be carrying these baits. Um, some do. Uh, they're usually a granule that you can sprinkle on the ground that will uh, attract the slugs and they feed on it. You can make your own homemade uh, slug baits though. Uh, one that is quite common is beer. Uh, just burying a saucer or something into the ground and filling it with a bit of beer and you might want to put a drop or two of uh, dish soap in just to break the surface tension. They're attracted to the, it's the, the yeast in the beer that actually is really attractive to them. Uh, they like that um, decomposing smell. So they're actually drawn to the beer baits. And uh, if you put a few of these out, you could um, check them periodically and strain them out and reuse it. Uh, if it goes a bit off, that's not a bad thing. It'll still work. So that's one thing you can do now. You can use grape juice as well. I've heard of people using grape juice instead of beer in their slug traps. That can work too. Um, the other uh, thing that some people will do or can do is put something between the rows that slugs would hide under because you'll notice that they come up on the plants more at night and do their feeding when it's more damp and moist and during the day they're usually hiding under some debris or trash or stubble so what some people will do is put boards between the rows where the slugs are thick uh, give them something to hide under and then just go turn over those boards i've heard of people using shingles like roofing shingles for that purpose. Um, even nursery pots, you can put them upside down, put them together, give them something to hide under, and then just be checking and physically removing them. Um, that might be a good first attempt before you buy some of the baits. The baits will be a bit more expensive than some of the regular insecticides. The other thing I should mention, there's quite a few things that like to eat slugs. And if you have a lot of mulch on the ground, you may also have a lot of ground beetles. These are uh, fairly big, usually black or brown beetles that are very quick. When you turn over a board or something, you'll see these black or brown beetles that scurry away. Those are often ground beetles. They are generalist predators. There's a lot of different types. We've got over 900 species of ground beetles in Canada. So lots of different types of them. And Slugs are one of the things that they like to eat, along with cutworms and some of the other things you probably don't want in your garden. That's great. Thanks, John. So the next question that was posed is, I've been told I need to fertilize my trees. Is it too late now? And what do I use for fertilizer? And I sent this question to Anthony, and he did respond and uh, with an answer. So I will share with you what he had to say about this. He said that given the low nitrogen levels in northern soils, it is important to fertilize fruit trees. So the answer is yes, you need to fertilize your fruit trees. When transplanting trees, fertilizer is recommended. So especially when they're, they're just newly transplanted, using fertilizer is recommended. It is important that a starter formation be used, example, NPK levels like 515.5 or 10.10.10. And that's just the, the formulation of a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. For established trees, so these are trees that are already growing and already planted, the easiest fertilizer mix is to use a 20-20-20 soluble fertilizer mix, or you add a certain amount into the watering can and water it in. You should read the fertilizer mix instructions on the container to determine how much to use and how often. So a product like that you buy in say Canadian Tire or, or any sort of store like that, uh, the miracle Grow is sold most often. It uh, is sold in these types of formulations. You know, it's very easy to mix into a pail or a watering jug, or you can buy one of those fancy um, watering, uh, spray watering nozzles that, that holds the actual miracle Grow in it. But generally, you know, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, but do read the instructions for how to mix that so that you know how much to use and how often. 
He also recommends that typically once in the spring, you would fertilize once in the spring and once in June or July. And do not fertilize in August or into the fall, as this may cause the fruit tree to keep growing and not go dormant properly for the winter. So don't fertilize your tree too late into the fall or into August because the tree needs to get ready for winter. It needs to go dormant so that when our cold weather arrives, the tree isn't still actively growing. And if that happens, it often is damaged and will affect your uh, fruit production the following year. So fertilize in the spring, fertilize when you're planting trees, and uh, don't fertilize too late into the, into the tail end of summer. So I got this question just the other day, and I'll tag Tom to cover the answer to this one. And this question is, what causes scabby potatoes, and how do you resolve this? Well, thanks, uh, Marty. Um, okay, so just uh, got a little bit of a picture of what uh, what I think uh, it's going to uh, look like. Uh, common scab. It's uh, caused by a bacterium-like organism. It's not a true bacteria, but it lives in the uh, and overwinters in soil and uh, fallen leaves. Um, I, I think one thing to uh, remember about it is that it is a tuber, tuber disease, and it occurs everywhere that uh, that potatoes are grown. Basically, uh, symptoms generally, just like the picture showed, uh, dark brown, kind of pithy-looking patches, and uh, almost a, a warty-looking uh, color and. Uh, uh, raised uh, lesions to it. Um, the, the lesions can affect uh, just a small area or, or they can completely cover the tuber. It just depends on how severe the infection is. The, uh, the, the biggest downside is that uh, it can survive indefinitely in, uh, in some soils. Like you're, if you got it, you're better off to be moving your potatoes from that area to somewhere else. It can be uh, transmitted by infected uh, seed. Uh, also wind and water will spread it. The organism survives on fresh manure. If uh, say a cow is uh, eating something that has uh, the disease on it, it'll go right through its uh, Stomach can certainly come out uh, as viable as it went in. So if you got an area where uh, there's a fair bit of manure, you should avoid that from a scab uh, point of view. Scab will enter, uh, enter the potato via pores on the skin, uh, wounds, and any kind of an opening that will, uh, will let it uh, let it come in will scab will be able to get through as for uh as for control uh first one is i'd always start with disease-free seed um, it may seem like a uh, reasonable idea to save some seed from last year to replant but uh, diseases uh compound over the generations in seed and especially in potatoes where you're uh, basically vegetatively propagating it. So I would recommend uh, using new disease-free seed. And russet varieties tend to uh, have less of a problem with scab than uh, red or whites. So if you have a problem with scab, I'd consider shorter season russet varieties. Uh, like I mentioned, avoid uh, use of fresh manure is uh one thing to remember there uh, another one and i think i mentioned it earlier was just to if you have a problem because it can survive in the soil so long just move your potatoes somewhere else uh it doesn't have to be a mile away i mean but just get it out of that uh that area where you have a problem even just by you know 20 25 feet is far enough uh 
another thing to consider is uh, good, adequate uh, irrigation. That that tends to uh, re reduce your problems with scab. Uh, you'll need to keep the soil damp, but the the biggest thing to remember here is don't overwater. Potatoes don't like to have uh, too much water, but yet it's a fine line there. Water them enough, but not uh, don't overwater. And that's basically it. Back to you. Thanks, Tom. So the next question I'm going to turn over to John. I got this picture submitted. What are these pink growths on my plum tree? And I've got a close up picture and uh, one from a little bit of a distance. And there are just massive amounts of small pink protrusions on the leaves of this plum tree. John? Yes, so these are called galls. And there's different things that can cause galls on plants. There's uh, some that are, and they're caused by either insects or mites. Uh, so there's basically three main groups. There's the, uh, some that are caused by mites, some that are caused by specific aphids, and some that are caused by very, very tiny little wasps. Now this one here, the ones that kind of stick up almost like fingers out of the leaves, they're called spindle galls or finger galls. So that's the common name for these. You see them on plum, choke cherry. In fact, there's a lot of different types of trees. You'll see um, spindle galls on, because uh, spindle galls is actually a, um, uh, a family of mites that causes these. Now, they're, they're very tiny mites. If you were to break open one of these galls and try to find them, you'd probably have a hard time seeing the mites themselves. They're pretty much microscopic. They're really tiny. If you had a microscope, maybe a really good magnifying lens, you might see the mites moving around inside the galls. Um, otherwise, you just won't see them. All you see is the spindle-like things coming out of the leaves. So what is happening here is when they uh, lay their eggs into the leaves, the the, the plant reacts almost like a cancerous growth. The, the plant material just starts growing in a very wild fashion. And the mites will live right inside these weird growths on the plants. And that's what we call the gall, the, the, the weird growths that you end up seeing. Uh, generally speaking, these are not economical to the point where you will have um, a much loss in production. They won't kill the tree, and again, uh, production is usually not set back much by the, the presence of galls. Galls are more an aesthetic thing, uh, just because it looks, it makes the, the leaves and the tree look, in, in some people's minds, more unsightly. Um, if you can handle the sight of them, they're really not going to harm your production much. Um, and they're very difficult to deal with. Um, you can't just go spray a miticide or an insecticide and, and hope to get good control. They're living inside the, um, the galls. So timing would be very, very tricky with these. And uh, timing, um, there are uh, some horticultural oils and things that can be used to try to reduce them if a person wants but the timing is really tricky and it usually has to be done quite early in the season. So I would say if you're wanting to do that, uh, get in touch with myself or somebody with some experience um, controlling them. Not that I have a lot of experience controlling these ones in particular, but I can at least give you some recommendations when to do it and what might work. Just a follow-up question to that, John. Um, if you have them this year, does that mean you're gonna have them next year? They do go through cycles. Um, you will probably have, if you have a lot of them this year, you will probably have them to some degree next year. But like a lot of insects and mites, the populations do fluctuate. So you'll notice that you get them bad for maybe a couple years, then the population really dwindles down. So th there's no guarantee. But like I said, if you have a lot of them this year, I would say you'll probably have some before the population seems to fizzle out. Okay. So I, the next question here that uh, we got, I'm going to ask John to address as well. 
something is chewing on my onion. What could it be? Okay, so there's a few possibilities here. It depends what you're seeing as far as plant feeding goes. The, the three main insects that would be feeding on onions are cutworms early in the season. Then late, a bit later in the season, you could get root maggots where you have um, maggots feeding directly on the bulb itself. And the third is something called thrips, really tiny insects that would be up on the leaves, scraping away, making little white splotches on the leaves. So um, cutworms, they're usually feeding in May and June. Uh, with the cutworms, you often will know they've been feeding. They, depending on the species, you, you may see clipped leaves, almost like someone took scissors. There's a few species that would do that. Um, and, and that's a clue when you see that plant material clip that there's probably cutworms feeding. And if you dig around the onions, you can usually find them and confirm that. Now, there are some species of cutworms that do less clipping. They'll come out at night and feed on the leaves, but not necessarily clip and go and hide in the soil during the day. Cutworms are nocturnal. They spend the, 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 the day hiding in the soil, come up at night and feed. So if you suspect cutworms, uh, unless you're out there at night looking for them, if you're looking during the day, you do need to dig around the infected plants and try to find the cutworms. Uh, cutworms are, are really tricky things to control. There are insecticides that can be used for them. Um, people on some types of plants will use cutworm collars around the plant just to prevent, make a little barrier, um, something like a, um, a, a cardboard roll or even a tin can that they can uh, place into the soil. If you're using cutworm collars, try to bury them at least an inch into the soil. The cutworms basically can't get at your plants that way. Uh, and I already mentioned there's lots of different predators of cutworms, two ground beetles being one of them. Now, onion maggot is a tricky one. The adult is a fly that uh, comes out in usually late May, early June. They almost look like a house fly, but their abdomen's a bit narrower and their legs are a bit longer, but they are very much house fly like. And they'll be flying around, laying eggs right up there, almost at the soil line, at the, at the base of the onion. When the eggs hatch, the maggots, are, they're little tiny white maggots. They've got no legs on them and just sort of a hook for a mouth part. They will make their way down and get right into the bulb area and feed. Now, when the onions are young, uh, this can really stress the plant out. And you may see leaves turning yellow. It may look almost like um, uh, drought symptoms where the leaves start turning yellow, um, becoming kind of wilty. Uh, if you are seeing that and you know the plant's getting good moisture, maggots are one possible cause of that. So you can, you'll have to dig around in the soil and see if you can find the maggots. If you tug on the onion and it kind of almost breaks off really easy at the soil line. That's probably maggots. They will cause some, uh, sometimes some rot to occur uh, near the soil tip as well. And they are a very tricky one to control. Um, in the past, people have used granular insecticides, but there's very few of those available, especially in the northern communities. You, you might have trouble accessing them. Uh, another option that can be used for um, onion maggot is floating row covers. If, if you know over the past years you've had really bad issues with this, you could try to get a floating row cover that you put on, um, mainly just to keep the adults off when they're laying their eggs. You don't have to have it on the whole year, but just to prevent that egg laying in um, uh, early May and June. So you'd want to try to time it for that. If you're using this technique, um, we, there is a formula that you can use. There's something we call degree days. So each insect starts developing at a specific temperature. And with onion maggot, it's four degrees. So when the temperature starts going above four degrees, we can start doing calculations and figure out at what point onion maggot should be emerging and starting to lay their eggs. And usually once we accumulate 250 or 300 of these degree days, 
we know egg laying should be starting. So if you're planning on using this strategy, um, you might want to talk to somebody in, in our ag department, and we could probably provide some updates on where we're at in your area for degree days. Uh, in the north, it's going to be very different than it is in southern Manitoba. So we, somebody would have to collect the temperature data and just do a bit of simple math to figure that out. But that's one uh, potential way you could try to deal with the onion maggots. Um, now the thrips, they're a tricky one as well. They're very tiny. They feed on the leaves. They have a what I call a, a scratch and suck type of mouth part. They basically, almost like a slug, they scratch the surface, make it bleed, feed on the juice, and you get these little white spots all over the onion leaves. That would be thrips if you, you have them. Uh, there's, a typical, there's a species called onion thrips that often ends up on onions. Uh, so if you're seeing that feeding, that is likely what you're dealing with there. Um, once again, tricky one to control. Um, there's insecticide options. Uh, row covers might help to some degree if you're using them for other things. Uh, but thrips are a hit and miss thing. It's hard to predict when and if they'll arrive on the onions. Um, so it's just something you want to keep an eye on. And um, if you do have to deal with them, uh, again, get in touch with us. We could probably walk you through a few options. Okay. Oh, I just need to go back one. Here's a question for Tom. How do I know when my potatoes are ready to eat? Okay, well, that's a good question. Now, let's, I think the biggest thing to uh, think about here is what do you prefer? There's really uh, no science here. If you like small potatoes and you're willing to live with a little bit uh, less yield and uh, that, go ahead and uh, harvest uh, your potatoes when they're small. If you want to to get more uh, more yield, more bang for your buck, so to speak, uh, you could go a little longer, let, let them grow a little longer. Um, it, there's no right or wrong answer there. It's basically a uh, preference. But the only thing I should say though, is if you're growing, planning to grow your potatoes to store them through after harvest, you should uh, let them mature which would allow the skins to set properly and that will in turn allow the potatoes to store better. But if you're just bringing them in to eat, you can harvest them anytime. Back to you again. Great, thanks, Tom. I just wanna, I just wanna add to that because if you're like me, I'm always anxious for a taste of those new potatoes because they always taste uh, so much better than, than potatoes that are, that are, you know, you're buying from the store that are maybe not as, as fresh Absolutely. So if you if you don't just don't pull the potato plant but dig around on the side of the potato till you find you know one of the potatoes under the potato hill and you can sneak a few out from the from the potato hills like that and leave the plant growing so that some will get a little bit bigger but if you you can we call it stealing steal from the hills uh, you know a potato here and there usually you can get enough for a few seeds doing that without actually pulling the plants and, and destroying the plants. Sneaky, but it works. Okay, so next we had a tree question. And um, I've seen a lot of this this year. And it's, uh, what is this on my Saskatoons? And there's um, some Saskatoons from my friend's yard. And uh, if I took a picture of my Saskatoon tree this year, it would look the same. And there are fuzzy uh, growths, protrusions on the Saskatoon berries. And so I checked with Anthony and uh, his response is that it's juniper rust. And it's a very common disease on Saskatoons, especially if your Saskatoons are located near juniper, which is an alternative host for juniper rust. So the disease kind of goes back and forth between the, the juniper and the Saskatoons. So his suggestion is that you would need to remove any ju juniper near the Saskatoons, meaning if you have juniper in your yard, you need to pick, do you want juniper or do you want Saskatoon? And uh, sometimes the, the challenge is, is that the juniper are in your yard, 
or if you're living in the north you may have a lot of juniper in the surrounding area so that is sometimes not practical uh, what you can do is pick off the effective berries and branches and remove them from the area to get rid of that juniper juniper rust so here's another question for john and uh, i took this picture of a friend's uh, cabbages and there are, you can see on the right there are or, sorry those are broccoli and you can see in the picture there are holes in the leaves of the broccoli plants the, the young broccoli plant and so i'll turn it over to john to describe what might be happening there yeah, okay, so th there's a few things that will make holes in leaves of broccoli plants. Now, uh, seeing the, the stage of these plants, my guess would probably be it's likely something called diamondback moth, or potentially there's a white butterfly you often see around called the small cabbage white, and its larva is called the imported cabbage worm and they will feed on anything in that cabbage family so it, it definitely could be an imported cabbage worm and sometimes it's hard to know until you actually uh, start looking and find the caterpillar now there's a third one that i'll mention that can cause um, some holes in cabbage and broccoli leaves that's flea beetles but that feeding is usually very early in the season and it's small little shot holes often to the cotyledons and really young plants so that's a little bit different and that wouldn't be what you're dealing with right here now the difference between the two uh, the diamondback moth and imported cabbage worm if you find the caterpillar and you disturb them a little bit if they get really agitated and they drop off the if they're tiny little green caterpillars and they're dropping off the leaves and dangling from a thread that'll be diamondback moth and that's an insect that blows in it doesn't overwinter here um, some years we get a lot blowing in some years they'll when they do blow in they'll settle more in southern manitoba other years they blow a lot further north so that's definitely one possibility now imported cabbage worm they're a bigger green caterpillar with a light yellow stripe down the back and they almost look velvety in appearance. So they're a bit bigger and they won't be dropping on a thread like a diamondback moth would. So um, you can tell the, the two apart by appearance and behavior. Now, as far as control goes, you've got a few options. Depending on how many plants you've got, if it's imported cabbage worm, they're big caterpillars. You can, or at least when they get large, when they grow, they, they can get pretty big. Um, you can go hand pick them. That would be one option. Again, depending on the size of your garden and how many cruciferous plants you have. There are some very selective insecticides on the market that kill basically caterpillars and nothing else. So if you do decide you want to use an insecticide, but you're looking for something that won't be killing bees and things like that, there's a product called Bacillus thuringiensis. It will be called, uh, sometimes you will see it sold as BTK, uh, so just the three letters, BTK, or sometimes it's called DIPEL, D-I-P-E-L. Um, those are the two most common versions of this in, in your garden centers and hardware stores. It's basically a bacteria that when the caterpillars ingest it, it messes up their gut and they end up dying, but it's specific to Lepidoptera, so the, 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 the group of insects that includes butterflies and moths, it kills their larva, but it doesn't kill anything else, so it's not going to kill uh, ladybugs, bees, ground beetles, um, any of the beneficial insects. So for insecticide use, that is a, a good choice. If anyone's growing the plants, the cabbage or broccoli more commercially, uh, there are insecticides like Corrigen and Intrepid that are somewhat selective. In fact, Intrepid also just kills um, Lepidoptera, so caterpillars. It doesn't kill bees and things, and Corrigen's in the same uh, category. It's semi-selective, kills 
uh, caterpillars, grasshoppers, a few things, but not bees. So you've got a few selective or semi-selective options. Uh, the other one I should mention as well, if you're growing them commercially, uh, there's a product called Entrust, which is um, also selective to some degree. Um, both Entrust and the BT products that I mentioned can be used in organic systems. So if you're growing your, um, a crop organically, BTK, Dipel, and Trust, they can be used in organic uh, systems. But you may have trouble finding the Corrigin and the Intrepid in a hardware store or garden center. They're more from farm supply companies. The BT products, probably a garden center or hardware store would carry those. I'll keep you on the line there, John. And here's a question for you. How do I keep cutworms out of my garden? You touched on cutworms before, but this is... This yeah, is so if, if I had an answer to that, I'd probably be able to make a lot of money. Uh, there, cutworms are a very, very tricky thing to deal with. And when we talk cutworms, we're not talking just one species either. There's several species that um, can get into the gardens. And the, the tricky part is, um the the eggs are laid in the soil in august and september and wherever they hatch out the next spring that's where you're going to have your your problem with your cutworms the next year so um it's it's very tricky to predict where they're going to lay their eggs again the adult stage is a moth and there's different species of them they're flying around late summer um Trying to keep them out of a garden situation is really, really tricky. And at, at that time of year, row covers and things probably aren't an option. Um, so the best thing you can do is really just uh, watch your garden carefully and try to figure out where it, they are starting to show up. Um, now, in my garden at home, I have used cutworm collars in the past. Uh, plants. I don't plant a lot of tomatoes, and and even in my beans at times, I've put cutworm collars around the stems before I planted them, and again, just bury those an inch or so into the soil. When you have a small garden like I do, you can get away with doing that. It's not too labor intensive for a small garden, but larger gardens that might become awkward and impractical, and then you do have to uh, keep your eye on things, and um, you could, again, in a garden situation, be trying to go out at night and pull them off the plants and kill them. Um, but again, bigger gardens, that might not be practical either. As mentioned, they're nocturnal. They're up at night feeding. They're hiding during the day. So finding them can be very tricky. Uh, we don't have a selective organic option like we do with the diamondback moth and imported cabbage worm. There are chemicals that work and some that work well. Um, I mentioned Corrigin earlier, talking about the diamondback moth and imported cabbage worm. That is also registered for cutworms and works very well and is semi-selective, but it might be very hard to find up in some of the more northern communities. Um, the farm supply dealerships might carry it, but likely hardware stores and garden centers wouldn't. Uh, there are products that you will find in some of the garden centers, hardware stores. They're mainly pyrethroid-based, so they they can work um, if you're open to using those products. Organically, again, they're very tricky. Um, hand removal, cutworm collars, um, a couple of the options you could consider. Okay. Next question we have is for Tom. How can we uh, can we grow corn in the north? That's uh, another uh, good question. Well, can we? I'm going to wimp out a little bit and say yes, but it depends. I don't want to go too far out here, but it, it really depends on how many frost-free days you get. I, corn is uh, going to require somewhere between uh, 100 to 120 frost-free days uh to uh to mature depending on what variety you choose so choose a variety that has a uh 
little uh, a few fewer days to maturity um, is going to uh, do, do better for you up north. A uh, in an ideal world, soil temperature should be over about 60 Fahrenheit for corn to properly germinate, and I realize that's not always practical. So you have to take into account your own area. Uh, am I gonna? When am I gonna get a 60 degree soil temperature? Is it gonna be too late to uh, be sowing corn? So maybe I have to. I have to go in a little bit beforehand. Uh, but another option, uh, well, I guess first, uh, just to reiterate that, you know, frosts are, are quite unpredictable and uh, whether it's corn or other vegetables, you know, they can uh, cause symptoms from uh, slight injury all the way to, uh, to death. So you're going to, you're going to run into a, uh, over the years when you're gardening, you're probably going to run into uh a number of times where you'll have varying degrees of damage and corn in its early stages can be very susceptible to frost whereas in the fall in its later stages it's a little less susceptible one thing that some uh, some people do is uh, they, they start corn inside and transplant it out uh, try, trying to get a bit of a, a head start on it much like you would with tomatoes peppers etc need to be quite careful uh, with with transplanting corn it, uh, it in a garden situation where you can uh, take care of individual plants it, it will likely do fine but don't uh, don't treat it as roughly as say you might be used to treating a more robust uh, plant like maybe a tomato uh, so if you're gonna go this route uh, just try to take care of uh, of the seedlings. Another thing to uh, to think about here is uh, genetics, like planting different varieties uh, that have varying days to maturity, and then keeping a record of which one of those varieties performs the best. Uh, if you have a frost, which ones are affected more or less uh, will benefit you in the long run in your uh, your corn production. You want to have some understanding about what works in uh, in your localized area for a variety, and uh, keep good records. Uh, there, there's always going to be a risk that, uh, in this case, corn, but any vegetable crop could be uh, could be set back, especially with a, uh, a spring frost, uh, late spring frost. Um, I, I guess one to, to just close of this question, the, the idea is if you do have a problem with frost one year, don't just uh, fold the tent and say, yeah, I can't grow corn. The odds are the next year you're going to be able to to produce corn. I, I, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Find varieties that will mature in, uh, in shorter days, varieties that you like the flavor of. Keep good records, and uh, if you do have a bad year, don't let it get you down, and try again the next year. Back to you again. Thanks, Tom. That's uh, that's encouraging. Next question that was posed is: Is it too late to plant trees? And so I asked Anthony and received his response, and his response is that. You can plant in the north from early spring to mid July, as long as it's not too hot in July. So I guess we've been having some pretty hot weather this last stretch. So he says uh, hot weather is over 25. So it might be that we have we have hit too hot of weather in July. Otherwise, end of June is the pretty much the cutoff for tree planting in the spring. The plants need enough time time to establish roots and prepare for winter. The other option is to plant in early to late fall before the soil totally freezes up and any plants that are dormant, meaning if the leaves have turned yellow and have fallen off, that would be a tree that is dormant, uh, you can plant it in the fall. You don't want it to start growing in the fall and then, you know, a big frost or snowstorm hits and, and anything that's newly sprouted, new buds or anything like that, they'll be very severely damaged and likely will kill off your tree. So, as long as the tree is dormant and it's late enough in the fall, 
then you can, can get a jump on your spring planting and, and get that tree planted in the fall. When you do plant it though, you wanna water it at least two to three times a week after you plant it and throughout the season, if, uh, especially if there's no rain or if the soil is dry. So taking care of that little tree in the first while will really increase its survivability. And the other tip I would give is to keep weeds and grass away from your newly planted trees because the tree does not like the competition for nutrients and it really stunts the growth of the tree and sets it back. So keep weeds and um, you know any competition away from that newly planted tree and it, it will do a lot better. Okay, so here's a question for Tom uh, that we received. What is this black rotten area on the bottom of my tomato? And the other question that came in kind of similar was, uh, what about blight? Thanks again. So just let me get my slide moving there. So what are the black spots on the bottom of tomatoes? Well, in a worst case scenario, you're gonna get a tomato that looks something like that. That's blossom end rot. But if it's just a small black spot, it's still blossom end rot probably. It just hasn't developed into uh, that, uh, that large scale uh, rot there. But in general terms, the most likely cause is going to be uh, blossom end rot. And blossom end rot isn't a disease. It's a, it's a physiological disorder where uh, the, the tomato fruit isn't getting enough calcium. And the most frequent uh, cause of that is basically uh, moisture, an adequate supply of moisture followed by periods where there's a bit of uh, water stress, uh, drought stress, and maybe even repeating that cycle a few times in the, uh, in the summer when uh, flowers are, or sorry, fruit is forming. And that, that's probably the leading cause of it. Um, the, the lack of calcium in the tissue will cause the cells at the uh, basal end, the bottom end of the, of the tomato to basically die. And that, that's what you see in those, uh, in those pictures. Uh, control. Well, even though I'm telling you it's a problem uh, with uh, calcium deficiency, it's, there, there's not a simple way to get calcium into your plant within the season. Calcium is notoriously unavailable to a plant. Like you, you can have fairly high calcium soil tests, and if it's in the wrong form, you're not going to, your plant isn't going to be able to use it. So most of the control measures aren't so much going to be adding calcium. If you want to add calcium, in your garden to continue over the years adding adding calcium will build calcium up but it's not going to be a an answer to a deficiency in the one in the season where you spot it so basically providing the plant with uh, an, um, an even amount of uh, moisture uh, is the best uh, the, the best way to try to minimize problems with uh, with blossom end rot. You don't want to have fluctuations. You don't want it to be getting drowned out one week and then just bake dry the next week. In a perfect world, maybe an inch every week instead of two and a half none, two and a half inches kind of thing. Um, oh, I got to the next one. That's, 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 about, perfect. Uh, that's perfect, Tom. Go, go ahead. The next question is, my radishes have flowers on them. Should I pull them out? And are they still okay to eat? Okay. Well, honey, I, I have a slide about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that. That, again, is a physiological disorder, and it's called bolting. It's not a disease. It's uh, due to environmental conditions. Uh, but basically, warmer temperatures, longer days, 
will cause bolting in crops that are that prefer cooler early season uh, growth. That's why oftentimes radishes that are planted early and harvested early are significantly uh, better radishes than ones that are planted uh, later on in the uh, in the season. Um, just here's a definition uh, sort of of uh, a bolting, uh, it, it's where it's prematurely going to seed, the plant is, and it, it's it's unusable. Uh, when I say unusable, it's just not a, uh, a plump, nice radish. There, there's nothing uh, poisonous or anything wrong with, with eating it. I find bolted radishes very woody, not tasty. Uh, that, that's my personal uh, preference. I wouldn't be eating them, but there's nothing inherently wrong that's going to uh, make someone sick. Uh, Control-wise, because uh, it's, it's basically uh, caused by temperature, your, your main uh, way of doing it is seed as early as possible. Or conversely, if you're looking for a fall crop, seed as late as possible to avoid uh, having the crop actually growing in the hottest days of the summer. Um, I, I know it, in my garden, I'm significantly farther south than you are, I realize, but uh, I, I can usually get two crops or radishes seeded sort of maybe five to seven days apart. But then after that, I can't seed radishes till into uh, into August. It just uh, it, it just isn't going to work. So anyway, that is uh, that's one uh, one way to uh, to look at look at control for uh, for radishes or for uh, bolting and radishes. Sorry. Good. Thanks, Tom. I've got uh, one more question here for John. And uh, the question is, why are there ants all over my pepper plant? Okay, so uh, to answer that question, it's gonna almost take a little bit of an ecology lesson here. Um, we have a lot of different types of, of ants. In fact, in Canada, there's 212 species. And in Manitoba, we've got uh, 52 different species of ants. And each of these species is slightly different in how they feed and what they feed on. Um, a lot of species are scavengers. They're looking for protein and they're also looking for sugary things. Now of the 52 species in Manitoba, 27 of them are associated with aphids. So aphids are those small things that cluster on your plants and they feed on the sap and they have to feed on a lot of this to get their proper nutrients. And they are constantly uh, producing what we call honeydew. They're constantly excreting this sugary liquid called honeydew, which ants really like. So you've got aphids on the plant feeding, producing honeydew, ants like the honeydew. And again, over half of our ant species are associated with aphids. They like to purposely hang out around aphid colonies and eat this honeydew. Some of the ant species, in fact, a lot of the ones associated with aphids, will protect the aphids. They will chase away predators and parasitoids, so things like lady beetles and lace wings and pirate bugs and hoverfly larvae. The ants would actually be chasing them away to protect the aphids so they can get more honeydew. So they're essentially farming the aphids, and some species go as far as taking the aphids down into their nests to overwinter them and bringing them back to plants in the um, spring to get them going again. So there's this really interesting relationship between aphids and ants. Normally when people are saying they're seeing a lot of ants all over their plants, either you've got something producing a lot of nectar that's attracting them or you've got aphids. So in the case of peppers, I would say look very carefully for aphids on the plants. That will likely explain why you have a lot of ants all over the plants. Okay. Uh, so Tom, I have some questions for you here. Last year I had cracks in my tomatoes. What causes this? 
Okay, well, cracks, uh, to tomato cracking is, uh, again, physiological in, in nature. It's usually that the, uh, the cells of the skin of the tomato cannot grow as fast as the tomato is expanding. So it's basically inside, it's like filling a balloon up. Say a balloon can take uh, enough air to make it six inches in diameter and all of a sudden uh, you put enough air in it to make it eight inches in diameter. Something's gotta give. In the case of a balloon, it's bang and it pops. But in the case of a, uh, of a tomato, it, it doesn't blow up like a balloon, but it does crack the outside of the skin. And that's, uh, that's usually where growth cracks come from. Again, uh, if we talk about control, uh, the, the one thing you wanna do is have even supply of water and uh, nutrients um, to try to minimize any, uh, any chance of cracking. But there are, there are times where conditions are just so good and tomato is such a robust plant that you're gonna find uh, growth cracking occurring. Some varieties are more prone than others to growth cracks. Most common uh, hybrids nowadays tend to have less of a problem. Doesn't mean they won't, you won't have a problem with them sometimes, but tend to have less of a problem than some of the older uh, non-hybridized varieties uh, from years ago. Thank you. Back to you. Good. Um, the next question I have for you, Tom, as well is, is um is there still time to plant something in my garden absolutely there is so if we're going to be wondering how wh what could we plant let, let, let's start with that we got to figure out when do we think the first fall frost is going to come and that's going to vary obviously depending on your location well just for argument's sake so say the 15th of September, it, it may be earlier than that up uh, in your world, but we, we just, all we do is we just pick a date and let's go from today's date. So today's the 29th, that leaves uh, 43 frost-free days. So basically the question is, can I produce, can I grow something that's gonna give me uh, an edible crop in 43 days? That's that's our, what we want to know. So in most cases from vegetable crops or in vegetable crops, non-fruiting crops are going to mature quicker. And by non-fruiting, I mean uh, crops where you, you eat the, the leaf part of the plant as opposed to the, the fruit. So leafing uh, examples of uh, leafy vegetables might be kale or spinach. They're, they're fairly short season. However, radish is also very, uh, very short season. It matures quickly. Um, so there is, in this case, I, I, radish is a root crop. It's not necessarily a fruiting crop, but you don't eat the leaves per se. You're, you're, you're eating the root that is produced underground. And kale and spinach, you're, you're eating uh, the leaf above ground. So I think everybody knows what uh, radish and uh, spinach and, and kale look like, but basically you're not gonna be able to, uh, to create a, a meal out of uh, just these alone, but you're, you're gonna have uh, some fresh, fresh sides, be it uh, for salads or, uh, or cooking. So, is, is one thing to remember here is when we're talking kale, kale is more frost tolerant than spinach. And both of those, kale and spinach, are more frost tolerant than radish. Because that will come into your thought process too when you're trying to decide what I can grow. If you're pushing that envelope already where you're saying I'm right on the edge to where I'd expect a frost, maybe you're better planting kale than say uh, spinach or radish. Now, kale can take up to 55 days to mature, or sorry, 55 plus days to mature, spinach 45, and radish, you can do it in as little as four weeks. Again, that's gonna depend on variety and uh, type of growing conditions. There's a lot of variables there. 
So in our 43 day scenario, unless we're going to uh, find some way to uh, to get the kale to mature quickly, I'm gonna rule out kale. Spinach is right on the bubble at 45 days because there's 43 frost-free days in the scenario. So we're left with radish basically. So, boy, that sounded bad, left with radish. I mean, radishes are good and that's what we have to choose from is basically <laughs> which variety to plant radishes up. So make sure you, you check your variety for days to maturity, find one that's in that four week range. Um, now, in the scenario that I laid out here, the odds are you could have all, any of those crops harvest before the frost, but it depends on the variety, it depends on the date of the first frost, depends not only how low the temperature goes, but how long the temperature below freezing lasts. Kale is very resilient. You can take kale down probably, or oh, at least minus eight uh, Celsius, and it will uh, it will green up again and uh, grow. The cells don't uh, don't burst from freezing. So kale is one to to consider, even if it is on the bubble for the for the days and it's back to you that's great so i guess uh i hope you like kale and and radishes you still have yeah. time for food. and as tom mentioned when you're when you're checking varieties and so on where you will find those days to maturity is on the seed packet the the information about how to plant them and uh, how long they will take to maturity that information is right on the seed packet or if you're online or, or using those kinds of resources, it'll be listed in the information uh, about that particular plant. Okay, so Tom, here's another question for you. I uh, had somebody ask me this the other day, do I really need to hill my potatoes? Well, I'm gonna answer that by saying yes, if you wanna maximize uh, yield of uh, edible tubers. So the tuber just, uh, I just got to go through a little bit of science here to explain here. Tubers are produced on an underground stem, basically, and that's called a stolon. Uh, the underground stems, the stolons, come out of the uh, axial of uh, leaves if they were above ground. So in the axial on a stem and a leaf where it hits, sunlight hits it, you get a, a branch growing out of it. If that's underground, where there is no sunlight to hit it, no photosynthesis taking place, that won't produce an above ground stem, it produces an underground stem, which will produce a potato. So basically, the more underground stems you have, the more potatoes you have. So you can plant your potato, say four inches deep, you don't need to plant it really shallow, potato is, robust enough to come up through four inches of soil usually. Um, but even in there, just that four inches of soil, you're not gonna have that many underground stems. And I just picked this picture off the web. You can see uh, the, the white, uh, the white stolons there are, uh, are running along the, uh, uh, to the tuber here from the plant. And each, each one of these long uh, white underground stems could produce a tuber. So the more of them, the better. And when we, uh, when we look at this, I just, uh, oh, sorry, I clicked, uh, I gotta get back here. There we go. Okay, so what we got here is a bit of a drawing that's going to, uh, on the left-hand side, you have your seed potato with a couple of sprouts. And as you go along, you can see not only is the plant growing, but the size of the mound of soil around that plant uh, at the base is growing. And lo and behold, when we add more soil to it, there's tubers that would have been above the, the soil line of the field or the garden that are now going to. Uh, be able to grow as tubers, not as a above ground stem or just your regular potato stem. It's underground now. 
and it's going to uh, going to produce a tuber. Uh, the uh, like I was saying, the more nodes that are below ground, the more potatoes that you're uh, going to get from a plant. And the, the other reason for hilling is to reduce the amount of greening. And by that, I think we've all seen potatoes that have uh, either in the garden or in our house uh, got in the sunlight for a little bit too long and uh, have varying degrees of greening on them, some just on the skin and some a little deeper. That, that greening's a reaction from the sunlight uh, getting on uh, the tubers and it produces uh, glycoalkaloid compounds. And those, those compounds, they don't taste great. They're fairly bitter. And I guess one of the reasons they're bitter is that if they're in high enough quantities, they, they can be toxic to humans. But the amount that's required to be toxic to humans is, is a significant amount. Uh, if you get a little bit, if you don't peel your potato perfectly and there's a little bit of green, no, nothing's going to happen to you. But still, you, you wouldn't want to go out day after day and eat green potatoes. So when I, I just looked for a, uh, a, a bit of uh, a picture to show you two differences related to greening. So on uh, the left hand side there, you have general greening covering uh, almost the entire surface area. And on the right hand side, you have where it's likely poked out of a hill when it was growing and the, the soil wasn't covering some of those areas specifically like right here. And uh, yeah, that is uh, one of the things to try hilling will avoid is uh, you'll get less greening. You're not going to, you'll never get away from greening totally, but you will get less greening and you will get more potatoes than if you didn't hill. Back to you, Marty. Good, thank you, thank you. So um, I'm just gonna answer this last question here. How much water does my garden need? Uh, quickly, generally your garden needs about an inch of precipitation a week. And so in those periods of time when you're not uh, receiving, you know, adequate rainfall that you may need to to water your garden and uh, water those plants that especially need uh, additional moisture. So I just want to share with the with the participants uh, some of the information that we have added to some of our materials and and so on. Uh, there are four new videos that have gone up on the a YouTube channel that Manitoba Agriculture has and uh, some of John's insect pest uh, questions and, and information is included in one of the videos there. Uh, how to plant trees in northern Manitoba, troubleshooting fruit harvest, uh, why might you not have fruit on your fruit trees, uh, some reasons why you might keep weeds out of the home garden. So those videos are all um, on our Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel. We are adding uh, additional ones as time goes on. So certainly, you know, check back regularly. There are some, some added. Now those are also included in another spot, which I'm gonna share with you in a, just in a short minute. So um, one of the things that we wanna stress and chat with you about is uh, to check your garden regularly, to spend time out in the garden, picking, checking for bugs as John made often you uh, suggested. Often you can uh, get rid of those, those pesky critters before they become a big problem if you're out there checking regularly. Now, Lori, I would ask, are there any questions from the participants? I actually do have a question here. Um, it was to Tom uh, regarding some potatoes. Do you wait until the blooms are done before you harvest? Well, you, you don't have to. The odds are that the potatoes are going to start to size better once the uh, once the flowers are gone. But if you're wanting to try smaller potatoes, again, whether it's uh, Marnie's idea of in quote stealing potatoes or whether it's harvesting the whole plant, you could uh, you could be doing that. There's no hard or fast rule. You have to wait. It's just strictly on size, whatever you size you would prefer. 
And that's all the questions I have. Good. Thanks, Lori. So I want to uh, bring your attention to some additional webinars that are happening in the near future. Actually, Tom is the coordinator for some of these horticulture school webinar series. Uh, there's one August 13th, September 10th, October 8th. And there's a link where folks can sign up on the Manitoba Agriculture website. There is, uh, if you look on the right hand side of the Manitoba Agriculture website quick links, there's a little link that says calendar and you can look through the, the month by month calendar there. And these events are listed in, uh, in that spot as well as the, the spot on your screen. These webinars are being recorded as is this one that, that he just did. So if you want to check the uh, Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel, you will see a number of various webinars listed there along with those videos that I mentioned. There are some separate playlists. The, the NHFI Northern Healthy Foods Initiative videos uh, are under a Northern Gardening playlist and the, the others are lo located under the Manitoba Agriculture playlist. Some really good information on those uh, horticulture school webinar series. We have some great information on growing sweet potatoes in Manitoba, fruit crops and fruit trees and diseases and so on. So definitely check those check those out. If you sign up for one, uh, you, you can register for all of them at the same time. And then you can share that uh, this information with, with folks you know too. I, uh, I mentioned just uh, previously about our, our NHFI videos that are on the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel. They're also located on the Manitoba government website under the Indigenous and Northern Relations page. Uh, you can also just Google Northern Healthy Foods Initiative resources and, and make your way to, to a number of resources that are designed specifically for our Northern Manitoba conditions. So there's quite a few of them. And as more are added, there being this list will be expanded. So uh, Manitoba government website and the Indigenous and Northern Relations webpage there's a link there for major initiatives and Northern Healthy Foods Initiative is, is listed there. And as I said, check back often to see what might be added that uh, you might be interested in, in seeing. I just have a screen here if you have questions as we go forward. That you, um, there are some folks that you are I'm sure very familiar with to, to contact with your questions, inquiries. We're hoping to have uh, some sessions in the future where we are hoping to include an option for folks to participate using their, their home phones, their landlines. As you probably are, are familiar to participate in these webinars, you can register using your computer, uh, you can use your cell phone. And uh, so there are a number of options. We're hoping to add an option for landline participation. But if you do have questions or comments or feedback, certainly these are the folks that you would, you would contact with those inquiries. Um, I also want to encourage you, there will be a survey that will be emailed to you at the completion of this, of this webinar maybe within the next little while. And I encourage you to fill out that survey where you have an option to add some uh, topics that you would like to hear about, uh, some information you might want to, to get uh, more of. I want to thank everyone for participating on the session today. And certainly I want to thank our panelists for their feedback and for their input and uh, being able to answer the questions that we had. And, and I think we need to work on stumping these guys. So we're gonna need to get uh, some complicated questions to see if we can see if we can stump them going forward. Again, thanks to, to everybody. Thanks, Lori, for organizing the webinar and for our panelists and our participants. Thanks to, thanks to you all. <laughs>